one other orthosis that I think is equally useful as a serial static orthosis, and that is a serial or serial static gutter. I don't really like the word gutter, but I can't think of a better term. This gutter that holds the PIP extended is very helpful for the last little bit of extension, which we know is hard to gain, but it is even harder to keep. So the use of this would be intended for keeping extension that has been gained, and I'm talking about primarily at night when active motion is not occurring. Here we see a patient post-dislocation who still has a bulbous joint but full extension, and when they are put in this volar gutter and wrapped with an elastic wrap, there's good compression for edema reduction and there's also maintenance of full extension at night. The serial gutter, however, I think it's useful to think about the same way we think about the serial cast, in that normally when we make a gutter, we make it as short as our cast, leaving the IP joint free and being a bit too short proximally because we create the length based on the web space. So we can do the same thing with changing our pattern for this uh, serial static gutter to maintain full extension of the PIP joint but increase the lever arms. If you look at the PIP joint of each of these and you look at the length of the lever arms, they are significantly longer when we extend both proximally and distally. Now it's difficult to cut a piece of thermoplastic material and hold it perfectly halfway up the finger and hold all the joints perfectly extended. There's just too much that needs to be done and there's not, there are not enough of your fingers to do it. So the technique we're going to demonstrate is to allow the thermoplastic material to hold itself on by wrapping it circumferentially. That allows us to focus on positioning and then once it's hardened we cut it down to exactly half the circumference. In my opinion it is not how tight this is wrapped on but it's rather how long it's worn. One useful technique is the use of small elastic sleeves. In the United States, they're marketed as digit sleeves. There may be others. The thermoplastic material can either be molded underneath or over the top of, and these are easy to apply and remove for a patient just to slip on at night. Remember, we are not using this to gain joint motion. We are only using it to maintain. The pattern for this is really very simple, and actually I usually don't even draw a pattern. But let's see if this illustration will help. Draw around the finger, identifying where the uh, web spaces are on the finger. Remove the hand from the paper and you have this drawing. This tells you essentially the width of the finger at its base, as well as the length of the finger. I want the thermoplastic material to come almost to the end. Maybe, it, maybe I want it to go beyond the end. It would depend. And I know that that is the level of the web space, that I cannot go below that if I'm going between the fingers. Then I mark the width of the finger, and that's simply going down at a perpendicular line from the web spaces. And then I look at the patient's hand and I determine the approximate distance from the web space to the distal palmar crease. And that's the distance that I want to then add proximally on this pattern in order to create the proximal line. So now what I've done is I have created the parameters for this pattern. These square edges are irrelevant because they're going to be trimmed away, but what is important is that this is a curved line all the way here. And that this is not too long, but it is long enough to go to the metacarpal phalangeal joint. So now we have a pattern that if we put it on the finger, 
we see that it'll go to the MP joint. I could have made it longer if I wanted to cover the fingertip for some reason. Usually that's not necessary. It's also important that we choose a thermoplastic material that is thin. The 1 16th or 1.6 millimeter is the thickness of choice. The material needs to have both a high draping capability and a very high memory capability. We're going to heat the material, wrap it around the finger, cut it down the top of the finger so that it stays together in a tubular shape. And it's the memory of the material that's going to hold it onto the finger snugly. So if you choose the wrong material and you attempt this pattern, it will not work successfully. Here we take a scrap of thermoplastic material that is as long as from the distal palmar crease to a bit distal to the tip of the finger. Additionally, we want to assure that the scrap of material is wide enough. Although I do not find this necessary, you can measure the finger. Here we're seeing that it is two and a half inches and compare that to the width of your scrap. You would like at least an additional inch. I now take the piece of material that's cut square and I'm marking the width of the finger. We're doing this a bit differently than we did in the previous uh, description of the pattern, but it's the exact same shape. We're marking the depth of the piece that we want to, to be over the proximal aspect of the proximal phalanx. When cutting this out cold, because the material is 1 16th in, it's important to keep rounded corners. With the material heated thoroughly, the material is quickly applied to the volar aspect of the finger and pinched together dorsally. Don't spend too much time doing this or the material will cool. Scissors then cut this close through the material. Now that the material is being held in place by the memory of the material itself, I'm able to hold the finger in full extension while the material cools. You can press over the dorsum of the PIP joint because that area is going to be eliminated. But you want to smooth out any pressure on the palmar aspect so that the pressure is well distributed. You'll notice that I've pulled the material so that it also covers the entire tip of the finger. If, however, you have a finger that has a bulbous PIP joint where the collateral ligaments are very sensitive to pressure, before you begin, you may wish to apply small amounts of exercise putty, as seen here. This allows us to mold the material directly over these areas, creating extra space so that when the orthosis is worn, there is not pressure on the sensitive lateral aspect of the finger. Here the material is taken just as before, pinched dorsally, and quickly cut with scissors as previously. Pulling the material up when it's cut allows you to get a really nice, very close cut so that the orthosis is molded perfectly to the shape of the finger. Again, we're holding it just as before, waiting for the material to cool. This does take some time and you should be patient and allow the material to cool completely on the patient's finger. Once it's cooled thoroughly, before you remove it, mark the exact mid-lateral location. Now I would normally mark this with a pencil, but it's being marked here with ink for the purpose of this video. Even though I've done this many times, I still mark it on the patient. When it's cooled, I can split it, and with a bit of pressure, I can pull it apart so that I can easily remove it from the finger. That allows me to cut exactly where it's been previously marked. 
and eliminate the entire dorsal aspect of the mold that I just created. Now that we've uh, eliminated the dorsum of this mold, we need to be sure that these corners we've created are not sharp. So each of those are then cut at a 45 degree angle to take the sharpness away. I then check the fit to be sure that uh, the orthosis is comfortable in the web spaces and that it fits the finger perfectly and that the finger is fully extended. Here, I've cut a mold much too shallow, and you see how flexible it is. But here, with our halfway up the finger, you can see that it's much more rigid. That alone is one of the most important reasons you want to be halfway up. This example is using a self-adherent elastic wrap, which allows you to very gently maintain full extension for prolonged periods of time, usually nightwear. This is also an excellent way to reduce any residual edema by providing gentle but well distributed pressure over the entire length of the dorsum of the finger. This is very comfortable to be worn all night and cannot be wrapped too tightly because of the mold. It can also be left in place and reapplied and removed a number of times before the self-adherent wrap needs to be replaced. Alternatively, the sleeve can fit over the entire orthosis and again provide an easy way to apply and remove this, especially if the orthosis is worn intermittently. In addition to the elastic sleeve, you may also wish to convert the design. We're taking the volar mold we've previously done applying a piece of warm thermoplastic material directly over, centered over the PIP joint, holding that in place while it cools. We're being very careful to mold exactly along the edges where the material overlaps so that these two shapes will fit together perfectly and create a closed circle, which is one of the most rigid shapes that you can create. I would add this dorsal piece if I was seeking to rigidly immobilize the finger at full extension. Here we see the volar and the dorsal piece being fitted together and we see how one overlaps the other creating a closed circular shape. I would then probably use a piece of tape to hold these together because hook and loop for this application would be relatively bulky. It's good to mark the proximal aspect of the dorsal piece so the patient doesn't turn it around. Hook and loop closure is ironically often my last choice. Because the PIP joint is frequently bulbous, it's not terribly comfortable to have a strap directly over the PIP joint. If, however, you determine that it is comfortable, I would mark the axis of the PIP joint as the location on the orthosis where I want to center the adhesive hook and then, of course, to apply the strap. So I take a small piece of adhesive-backed hook and apply it to the orthosis, centering it over the mark that is the center of the PIP joint axis. This is on the volar aspect. Then I take a piece of strapping material and I determine how long the strap needs to be. I start it on one edge, go all the way around and back over on itself. That allows me then to determine exactly where the loop material will begin to overlap the orthosis. On one end I'll be marking uh, one side and on the other end I mark the other side. This then allows me to determine the strapping locations by cutting one half of one side 
and one half of the other side as shown. When applying to the patient's finger, leave one strap attached and then the patient only has to deal with one other strap for full closure, making it very convenient for application and removal and you know that the strap is positioned precisely in the correct location. Mm -hmm.